Hello there, my very good friends. Andy Murray here for What Culture Wrestling, back again with another one of those videos. It's story time, and today we're going to talk about WCW and maybe, no, definitely the worst gimmick idea that I have ever heard. I'm Andy for What Culture Wrestling, and this is the one WCW gimmick too offensive for Eric Bischoff. To know Eric Bischoff's mantra is to understand why he'll go down as one of the most divisive men, maybe in wrestling history. From his time as a WCW on-air personality, producer and executive vice president, all the way through to the man he is in 2020, the often polemical podcaster he is today, Eric Bischoff has always gone by one saying, and it's a saying he loves so much, he even named his autobiography after it. Controversy creates cash. It's a saying that has always informed his public persona, and for better or for worse, the guy is known for stirring the pot. It's how he made his name. And if it wasn't for living by controversy creates cash, then, well, I think there's a very good chance you may never have even heard the name Eric Bischoff. That the guy gets people talking is undeniable, and there are plenty of examples where sticking to this mantra makes the guy look like one of the biggest geniuses in wrestling ever. I mean, look at the New World Order, right? He played a big, big role in coming up with that, and it was a stable that defined WCW for a long, long period and helped carry them through one of their most successful, profitable, and popular periods. On top of that, let's not forget that he pioneered the idea of a heel authority figure before Mr. McMahon came along and perfected it over in the other company. But, you know, there's another side to all of this as well, because if I'm going to stand here and give Bischoff credit for helping come up with the New World Order, well, then I've also got to hold him culpable for letting the damn thing stretch out so long and basically become a massive farce by the end. But there's other things as well. I mean, controversy's all good and well, but when you're sitting there and you're spoiling Monday Night Raw uh, live on your little Nitro broadcast and you say, hey, Mick Foley's gonna win the world title, and then 100,000 people change the goddamn channel, well, that's not good, is it? But I think what these examples really do is paint the picture of a man willing to do anything to gain even the most incremental advantage over the competition. Well, almost anything. Even Eric Bischoff had a line, as we're about to learn. Inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2019 were Harlem Heat, Stevie Ray and Booker T, who debuted in WCW in 1993, split in 1999, and during that time won the company's tag team titles 10 times. The tandem, who by the way are real life brothers, debuted on the Texan indie scene in 1989 working as the Hoffman brothers. After a few years grinding away, they attracted the attention of veteran manager Skandor Akbar, who brought them into the Dallas-based Global Wrestling Federation in 1992. It was there that Stevie and Booker became known as the Ebony Experience. Now, they quickly became fixtures in the GWF and had a bunch of title reigns there, but they weren't there for a terribly long time. They had their first match in the GWF in April 92, and they were off to WCW by the summer of 93. When they got there, WCW switched a few things up. The team was kept intact, but rather than being billed from their native Houston, they were hailing from Harlem. They became Cole and Kane. Those were the ring names, and soon the heat was on. They're still, well, I mean, obviously still, WCW's not a thing anymore, numerically the most successful tag team in company history. No team had more tag title reigns than Harlem Heat. And Booker, well, he'd eventually become a singles legend as well. You know, the whole five-time thing. Basically, what I'm trying to say here is that when Harlem Heat were inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2019, it was deserved. It was earned. I mean, they weren't quite a tag team on the level of, say, I don't know, pick one out of your head, the Midnight Express, there you go. But they were immensely popular and really prominent for one of America's biggest wrestling promotions when that promotion was at its most popular itself. But they may never have had that Hall of Fame level career had WCW gone through with the original plan for their debut. Pictured over here on the Bantertron right now, that's what we call it, isn't it? The banter? I don't even know. But pictured over here right now on your screen is one Robert Fuller, who's decked out in full managerial garb for his WCW character, Colonel Robert 
Parker. This guy right here was based loosely around the manager, the famous manager of Elvis Presley, Colonel Tom Parker. And if you're wondering why I'm holding an iPad like a total bell end, it's because I've got a quote here on Tom Parker from famous biographer Alana Nash, who described him as the most controversial, colourful, and larger than life figure in all of entertainment. This guy managed Elvis Presley. Let that sink in for a second. Now, of course, this Colonel Robert Parker fella, he wasn't explicitly a plantation owner. That wasn't the gimmick, but he kind of dresses like one, doesn't he? To illustrate this, how about we take a quick look at Don Johnson's character in Django Unchained? Then let's flip back to Colonel Robert Parker. Do you see the similarities here? I mean, even if you don't, why don't you fire up your little Google images right now, open another tab right now, type in plantation owner at the top of the screen. You will see little Robert Parkers all over the place. So WCW had this manager on their books whose aesthetic was pretty much that of a plantation owner. And they had this hot new up and coming surging African American tag team coming in. Now, not necessarily a huge problem if they keep them miles apart, right? I mean, this guy's not actually a plantation owner, he just kind of dresses like one. Well, unfortunately, keep them apart, they most certainly did not. What WCW decided to do was take the Ebony Experience, rename them The Posse, have them come to the ring in chains, shackled up around their necks and stuff, with Colonel Robert Parker, a white guy in a plantation owner's outfit, leading them down to the ring. Like slaves. Just let those optics marinate for a moment. Do that and then we'll continue. Now the good news is that this alliance lasted only a single TV taping at the famous Centre Stage Theatre in Atlanta, Georgia. And the good news, even better news, is that the footage of it never aired. Now the horrible aesthetics of this situation really shouldn't need any explanation, but it took one man to step in, put the foot down and say no, n we can't do this, honestly. Who was that guy? Well, it was none other than Mr. Controversy Creates Cash himself, Eric Bischoff. I've got a quote here uh, from Mark Madden in his Pro Wrestling Torch column dated June 28th, 1993. He says that Bischoff saw what was about to transpire and barred the gimmick from TV, calling it a rare moment of lucidity from Easy e now the idea with this gimmick wasn't to put the posse over as actual slaves. I've got a quote here again from uh, David Shoemaker in the book The Squared Circle, Life, Death and Pro Wrestling, who says that they were supposed to be a pair of death row convicts who had been won in a card game by Parker, who came to the ring as if straight off the plant. They were won in a card game. And then they were led to the ring as if they were straight off the plantation. I've said that twice and I wrote this down because I still don't believe it my bloody self. This is mental. But of course, anyone with a working brain can seemingly see why this wouldn't work on TV. Why it just wouldn't fly. The optics are terrible. And the next question you might be about to ask is who the hell came up with this damn thing? Well, unfortunately, it's not entirely clear. Even Stevie Ray and Booker T in public, well, they've told completely different stories on this. Booker has said that he has no idea who came up with it, but that he was deeply humiliated by the whole thing. Stevie Ray, on the other hand, once said that him and Booker came up with it themselves. But um, his version is a little bit different as well. He talks about the chains around their neck, representing that they'd been wrongly imprisoned, they were off death row, and this was to symbolize that wrongful imprisonment. On top of this, Stevie Ray also says that Colonel Parker, he was never supposed to be involved. He was just a last minute guy. He was hanging out at ringside and they just brought him in, not realizing how bad the whole thing would look. But general consensus on this gimmick's origin is entirely different. And this is the most popular version of the story. Somebody else, somebody entirely different came up with this character. And you might ask, who was it? Was it Vince Russo? Well, no, it's too early to be Vince Russo. Ole Anderson, he was on creative. Dusty Rhodes, he was there as well. No, it was Sid. <laughs> Sid Vicious, apparently, which is, <laughs> this is ridiculous. And speaking of Sid, who I think, by the way, is one of the funniest performers of all time, not because he came up with terrible racist gimmicks, uh, but Mark Madden's got another comment on him here from the same Pro Wrestling Torch column. Uh, he says, it is an absolutely undeniable fact 
that the gimmick was fought off by all people, Sid. So there you go, Sid did this. And not only that, but to make matters worse, this stupid pitch was actually approved by several powerful people on creative, including Ole Anderson and including Dusty Rhodes. And when Mr. Madden contacted the WCW office for a comment from Dusty or Ole, he just got fed a load of waffle. He was told that Ole says it was their gimmick from when they were back in Texas. I find that very hard to believe. Now I think I'd be remiss not to mention intent here. I think it's very unlikely that Sid Vicious or whoever this was was like, hey, yeah, I'm just gonna do a massive racist gimmick. I think that this was probably just the product of ignorance and someone being a bit stupid and realizing that the image of this plantation owner guy with a couple of African-American wrestlers in slaves was gonna look horrible. They should have realized that this was gonna look horrible but they didn't. The people who were gonna find this thing offensive should have been really quite clear, and it really did spark offense. Stevie Ray, when he speaks about this, he says that the building was hot in Atlanta, there was heat all over the place for what he called their tryout match, and he too shares the belief that this wasn't deliberate racism. And afterwards, as you can probably imagine, the team weren't all that happy with management, because this thing was awful. It didn't last, however, it can't have lasted, because Harlem Heat were a thing just two months later, they were on TV, and they were doing their thing. Without all the bollocks. So I think what we have to do now is thank the heavens for Eric Bischoff and his moment of lucidity, because if he hadn't had that, if he hadn't put the foot down, and if this thing had made it to TV, well, I think it's safe to say that Stevie Ray and Booker T as Harlem Heat may never have had that Hall of Fame career. It would have tanked their early prospects and it would have really been a terrible look for everyone involved. But unfortunately, Stevie and Booker would have to go through a bunch of racist bullcrap later in their careers as well. I mean, let's hark back to Booker T versus Triple H in WWE. What was it Triple H said? People like you don't get to be world champion. Hmm, and as for Stevie Ray, well, he filed a racial discrimination lawsuit against the organization formerly known as WCW that was settled in 2003. And let's not forget as well that WCW is the same organization that signed off on Buff Bagwell donning full blackface to mock Ernest the Cat Miller on a Nitro segment in 1999. It's not like there wasn't a whole bunch of just really gross stuff on those shows and coming out of that creative team at times. But at the end of all this, at the very least, in the case of Harlem Heat, in the case of Booker T and Stevie Ray and the posse, Eric Bischoff had clarity. Anyway guys, that's it. Story time is over. That's my take on, I mean, yeah, it's one of the worst character ideas of all time really, isn't it? So. As always, I'm interested in your take, so go and hit the comment section, leave that down below. After that, you can like, you can share, you can subscribe, you can ring that bell for notifications if you want to. I'm not your dad. Then you can follow us on Twitter at WhatCultureWWE and myself at AndyHMurray, where you can tell me how wrong I am. Goodbye.